Casey Kane is a NASCAR fan favorite. He has always been an easy guy to root for. Holy cow, he had talent. One of the most talented NASCAR drivers of the 2000s, for sure. He was also one of the biggest what-ifs in NASCAR history. A true heartbreak of a career. Someone who deserved so much better. Let's break it down. First, I want to talk about his unlikely rise to stardom. Kane started out as a relatively unknown driver in the USAC dirt racing series in the late 1990s. As a teenager, he caught the eye of Steve Lewis, a person well known for spotting raw talent. Jeff Gordon, Jason Leffler, Kenny Irwin Jr. Notable finds. Lewis hired him to drive for his USAC team where he won the Rookie of the Year and the Midget Championship. Over the course of the early 2000s, Kane would find himself rising in the world of dirt racing, competing in the world of outlaws as early as age 20. By 2002, Robert Yates had hired him to drive his number 98 Channel Lock Ford, which by the way is an absolutely fantastic paint scheme. He was mediocre. Not great, but needed more time to grow. In 2003, he raced full time in a number 38 Great Clips Ford, still for Yates. At this point, he was still a fairly unknown prospect, as the likes of Scott Wimmer, Scott Riggs, Ryan Vickers, and Martin Truex Jr. were taking the series by storm, not to mention all the bushwhackers. He ran well. He kept his car out of trouble for most of the season, and at Homestead got his first NASCAR win. White flag is up, and Casey Kane is on his final lap in pursuit of his first NASCAR Bush Series win. Enumclaw, Washington is the place. It's Casey Kane, a NASCAR Bush Series winner for the first time. He takes the Ford 300 at the Homestead Miami Speedway. Nobody talks about this win because it was overshadowed by the excellent championship battles the entire weekend, including Xfinity. But this win caught the attention of one Ray Everham, so much so that he brought Kane out of his developmental contract with Ford. This caused some legal trouble, but was resolved before the season started. Through the Cup Series we go. Kane's 2004 season is well documented. Always the bridesmaid, never the bride. Five second place finishes, some of them in heartbreaking fashion, not to mention Dover. And Kane and Martin pull away just a little bit from Tony Stewart, who fires hey, it in three. Kane lost it. Oh, there's oil. There's oil on That's the racetrack. Oil on the racetrack. And Charlotte. The car has really gone away. This is going to get in trouble. Turn two. Oh, oh my no. goodness. Casey Kane, the race leader, has hit the wall. Oh my God. And Chicagoland. Always so, so close to breaking through, but just couldn't quite do it. The future was bright, however, and we moved to 2005. 2005 was, for lack of a better word, disappointing. The entire Everham organization seemed to have taken a step back. Kane had his sophomore slump and was a non-factor most of the season. Nowhere close to a playoff spot. There was one major positive, however. No pressure from behind. He took over the number nine from legend Bill Elliott. He served as his mentor for a season, and now it's on its own. Off turn four. Casey Kane is a winner at last. He finally got that cup win. Very well deserved and a long time coming. It was clear to everyone, Kane, if he can put full races together consistently, could become a superstar. And in 2006, that's exactly what happened. Oh. My. Goodness. This is what I would like to call a breakout season. This is the Casey Kane we all knew was there. Six wins, many of them coming in dominating fashion. Atlanta. 29 years to the day. Since the Dodge has gone to victory lane in Atlanta when Richard Petty held off David Pearson and Cale Yarbrough to win it, 
Casey Kane scores the second win of his career in the Golden Corral 500. Texas. A oh, little, little swerve there, a little wave. All he needs to do is get through turn three and four one more time. And Casey Kane will become the second Dodge to win here. The first man to win from the front row, the 11th different winner at Texas, Casey Kane, wins the Samsung Radio Shack 500. The Coke 600. Got clear sailing of four cars up ahead of him, but I don't think it's going to be a factor. He will lead 158 laps tonight. Casey Kane leading this train on the final lap. Here he comes. Engine engine number nine brings it to the finish line. Casey Kane wins the Coke 600. Where three of his more dominating wins this season. After 26 races, he was a favorite to win the championship, even after his mini slump in the summer months. Five wins in the regular season, never below 12th in the standings the entire season. He was 11th going in the Richmond. Had to perform very well to make the chase, and he did. Third place run to get in as the 10th and final driver. Like I said earlier though, if he could rekindle his early season magic, he could be a title contender. So how did he do? Duck trouble, Stewart and Casey Kane. Kane, one of the championship chasers. Talked to him on Friday about all the bad luck he's had at this track, and now more of it. Second caution of the race, heavy damage to the nine car of Casey Kane. The hood is up on pit road. Word from down there, finished. Marty? They looked inside the engine to see if it was a spark plug, and indeed it was uh, something internal. These guys are done. This is an unbelievable turn of events, Bill. Or finishes outside the top 30. Yeah, that's not going to cut it. Any chance of Kane being a champion this season was quickly wiped away, and he came home eighth in the standings. For most of the season, he was better than that. On to 2007. The Jeremy Mayfield saga was happening the entire time Kane was having a career year in 2006. The outside noise saw the team as a whole take a major step back in 2006 outside of Kane. In 2007, unfortunately, Kane regressed to the mean. He was, to put it lightly, mediocre. Had no chance of making the chase at any point, which was sad to see because we know he has a talent to be a champion. There were a couple high points, but lots of low points. Highest in points the whole season, 19. The final race. They did get a pole at Vegas and had the best car at the Sharpie 500, but that was about it. The team was looking for a rebound in 2008, and they got one, at least a little bit. For starters, Casey Kane got a million dollars richer. Keep that focus, one more corner, hit your marks here. Clear for the 15. Race pace, 30.5. Only two other cars, three other cars are running that. And here comes Casey Kane, the fan favorite, wins the Sprint All-Star Race. Oh, by the way, young man, it's Bud for you. <laughs> Good work, Bud. He did a rare feat of winning both the All-Star Race and the Coke 600 the following week as well. He got voted into the All-Star Race. He was in it to win it. Banked a million dollars last week. And Casey Kane, the 2006 winner. Now there's six. Comes off the corner, and Casey Kane wins the Coke 600. Edward. It was a remarkable four weeks to be a Casey Kane fan, because he won at Pocono two weeks later. One more turn to go for Casey Kane. This will be a true team victory. Battle back from the problem on pit road. Started on the pole, four of the last five. Now five of the last six races at Pocono have been won from the front row. The pole winner's gonna take the checkers. Casey Kane wins at Pocono. Three race wins, including the one exhibition, in a month. Ninth in points after Pocono, and people looking at him as a dark horse for the title if he could keep it up. He didn't. The wheels fell off in August with two 40th place finishes in a row. Fell six positions and points in three weeks and never recovered that mid-season magic. 14th at season's end after a mediocre last 10 races. The talent was still there, and so was the potential. 2009, here we go. Kane actually has a solid season. 
It did get off to a slow start, but he kept the car clean and out of trouble. Unlike in 2006, Kane was at his best in the summer months, including at road racing. Hey, Casey's done a nice job. It's a lot of pressure doing that over and over again. Casey Kane's father supported his racing Clear career from a very early age. Sent him off to the Midwest from Enum Paul, Washington to further his racing career after he got out of high school. Now he comes back to the West Coast and Casey Kane wins at Sonoma. This win gave him the confidence he needed. For the next two months, Kane's worst finish was 17. Not only was he keeping the car out of trouble, he was really, really fast. Made his way to the top 10 in the standings. Through a mediocre Sharpie 500, he rebounded in a major, major way. In the chase, they came to Atlanta on a mission. And here, under the lights at Atlanta Motor Speedway on a Labor Day weekend, Casey Kane gets it done and goes to victory lane. Top five in points going into the chase. Fourth, to be exact. He has a good shot to win the title. Very consistent from June onward, kept the car clean and made noise at the right time. He's bound to have a great chase, right? Wrong. Trouble for the nine car, Casey Kane. Smoke billowing from the back of his Dodge, and we told you there had been people leaving, uh, all kinds of internal conflict, people leaving, bailing out of the engine room because they said they were going to close it down because of the uh, merger with Yates Racing for 2010, and obviously this is not a good sight for Casey. From Casey Kane's onboard camera now coming out of turn four down the straightaway. You can see there are already some rubbing going on coming out of turn four. These guys just battling as hard as they can right here at the end of the race, trying to get the spots. And that's when it's all going to happen. Get low, get low, get low, get low. Hmm. Come through the middle, come through the middle. Right where you at. Keep coming straight, keep coming straight. Michael Walter grew, drove right through the center of that. You see, even Matt Kenseth got damaged. Casey Kane got the back of the 31 of Jeff Burton. Just like 2006, four finishes outside the top 30. The first race, look what happens. Add in the crash at Auto Club and other bad runs, and he finishes 11th out of 12 at season's end. 2010 was just like 2007, where Kane was just off. At this point, Everham emerged fully into Richard Petty Motorsports, and Kane was the odd man out. By this point, Kane's crew chief was Kenny Francis, who thick and thin. Nowhere near the playoffs for most of the year, and one big moment people remember him by. Oh, 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 oh Casey Kane gets turned around. Greg Pickle and Hall. Mark Martin is there. No caution has come out. They're going to let him race back. He's going to be in, and now the car's in six. Eric Almarola replaced Kane at Everham with five races to go in a really frustrating way, and Kane moved to Red Bull Racing's 83 car. Jimmy Elledge was his crew chief for the final five races, and they ran solid. Three top 15s and a pole in the final race at Homestead. It was announced in 2010 that Kane would join Fenwick Motorsports in 2012 and drive their flagship number five car. He would be in top equipment once again. First, though, we have a stopgap year. Ah, uh, yes. 2011. Nobody talks about Kane's time at Red Bull Racing, especially not those last five stars in 2010. But it was this year, to me, that proved Kane had the talent to deserve another top opportunity. Red Bull Racing was terrible. Vickers was a wrecking ball, and their cars in years past didn't have the speed, which meant Kane would have to overachieve. He did. He was reunited with Kenny Francis at the start of the season, and then they consistently outperformed Vickers in the same equipment. He was averaging around 10 spots and points better than Vickers, and he kept the car out of trouble. He won the pole for the Southern 500, and won the second to last race at Phoenix. Edwards and Stewart, gonna go to the season finale, oh so close to the championship. Today though at Phoenix, it's about Casey Kane and Red Bull Racing, scoring the win, breaking a long dry spell. Casey Kane wins the Cobalt Tools 500. Eight top fives in a Red Bull car. Five of those top fives came in the chase, too. He was a chase caliber driver in that equipment, and that cannot be overstated. Kane has a talent and the drive still, and he proved it here with a 14th place points finish at season's end. 2012 began a new chapter in Casey Kane's career, and for the first time, he was in truly top equipment. 
His teammates are arguably the most famous NASCAR drivers of the last 20 years. He was with the best of the best. Kane would make it to the chase easily in 2012, and even though his 2006 season was statistically better, I consider this season to be the closest he ever got to winning a title. He has a dominating Coke 600 win. Each one their 300th start. That's the number Casey Kane is on tonight. Pretty nice celebration. Around the turn to the front straight away, the 13th career win for Casey Kane is the Coca-Cola 600. A couple other wins. And he scored two poles during the chase and was in contention every race except for Texas. Unfortunately, to win the title, you need no mistakes, no mulligans. Despite his fourth place run at Phoenix the next week, he was too far back to make any major impact in the final race. Hopes were very high for Kane going into 2013 for good reason. He was still with Kenny Francis, and he was still in fairly even equipment to start the year. Let's see Casey Kane shine! Carnage down toward turn number one, Montoya, Harvick, Carrillo, Apert, all with damage as the caution comes out. Sorry, wrong footage. I said, let's see Casey Kane shine. Just bring it on home here. Sails it off into turn three, gets underneath Joey Logano, and Casey Kane wins the Food City 500 at Bristol. He was as high as second in points early on in the season, and even though he had his usual mid-season dip, he recovered nicely by summer's end to get a critical win. Big run into turn one for Casey Kane on the here. outside! Yes, you and him. Still there. Hey, when you're the leader, you don't have anything to judge off of down there. I think Jeff Gordon was a little too easy getting down in there. What's going to happen in the tunnel here? Wow, Casey Kane just drove that car in the corner. Wow. This is a team and a driver that I've been waiting and waiting and waiting to break out and to just tear off two or three wins. What a performance by them today. Yeah, not only are they moving up inside well inside the top 10, a second victory for the year. Uh, we're going to talk about him being a part of the chase for sure. And not only that, probably being a championship contender. The checkered flag at Pocono today, Casey Kane. Sadly, though, the wheels fell off in the chase and he finished 12th out of 13 drivers. Not what we were looking for. 2014 rolls around and something is clearly off. We start to get to the point now where I think Kane got the worst of the Henrik equipment. Junior and Gordon improved big time, while Kane was inconsistent at best. He was still finishing towards the front. Mostly. But he just looked. Off. Barely in contention for the chase, on the outside looking in. He would need a very timely win. Checker flag in the air, the timeliest of wins for Casey Kane, who punches his ticket into the chase for the NASCAR Street Cup. He got it. Sadly, when the revamped chase rolled around, he did nothing of note and was a quick round of 16 elimination. 2015 and 2016 were almost identical for Kane. His performance took another step back both seasons and did not get the win he was looking for in either year. 18th and 17th were his two points finishes these two years. 2017 comes along, and there are questions about Kane's future. Some are calling for him to be released from Hendrick at year's end. Others want him to have another year. However, he was still very popular with the fans and in the garage. He was going to get another shot. Not to mention, he got the win of his life about halfway through. Great restart for the five of Casey Kane. Can he hold it on the bottom of the track? Kane gets by him! Smoke rolling out behind the 11. Casey Kane in front of the two of Brad Keselowski. They go down the back stretch. Still smoke coming out of the 11. He gets up the racetrack. And the 11 goes around. They wreck behind him. Did they get to the overtime line? They haven't got there yet. Has the caution come out yet? Now the caution comes out. The question will be, did the caution come out after he crossed the overtime line? 
Casey Kane. So many question marks around what's going to happen in his career. Needing a win to get into the playoffs, and he gets it at Indianapolis Motor Speedway. This moment presented by Sunoco, fueling victories all season long. He will be taking the checkered flag. And there's the celebration. He was back. He was in the playoffs and he was here to stay. Only to get knocked out in the round of 16 for a second time. It was not enough to give him another chance at Hendrick. He did, however, end up in the 95 for Levine Family Racing in 2018. Not terrible equipment, but definitely mid-pack. He was back to his usual self, keeping the car out of trouble and staying fairly consistent. He almost shocked the world at Daytona, too. Comes the top. Here comes the top side. Truex. Three wide. Not gonna block that. He's side by side for the lead. He's actually gonna lose the lead. Casey Kane. Casey Kane, after running at Henrik Motorsports for so many years, loses his job there. Goes to the 95 team. And now Casey Kane leading the field at Daytona. You don't think Casey Kane's going to block, do you? I can promise you, leaving Hendrick Motorsports going to drive for this team, he wants to prove to the world that he can still drive a race car. You're going to see some aggressive blocking from Casey Kane. Unfortunately, there is one factor about Kane's career that I have not mentioned yet. His health. He would get very dehydrated after most races, and he no longer had the durability to run the full 400-500 mile distances. He tried everything. IVs before the race, massive amounts of water in the days leading up to the race, and so on, but it was not enough. His body began to give out on him before he was ready to go, and his final race was the Southern 500. Why is this a heartbreak, you may ask? Kane had an offer from Tony Stewart to drive the 41 car in 2019. This was top equipment for a top team for a driver who I firmly believe still had the talent. Plus. He was about to reach his statistical peak. He was going to be a title contender, easily. But he had to decline the offer. It's heartbreaking. He became a superstar as Everham was on the decline. He has an excellent year in mediocre equipment at best, and nobody notices. He starts off very strong at Hendrick, but tapers off as he clearly was their fourth wheel. His last win wasn't enough to save him, and he goes to a small team. He still has the drive, the fire, but has been so unlucky. He finally gets a top offer he deserved from Tony Stewart, and he has to decline due to his health. No send-off. No swan song season. Not likely to be a Hall of Famer, despite his Hall of Fame caliber talent. Not out with a bang, but with a whimper. Casey Kane's NASCAR career is the epitome of heartbreak, and we can only wonder what could have been.